everyone, and welcome to today's MenMD Real Talk webinar, Injection Therapy Online Clinic. My name is Ashton, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MenMD, and I'm exciting to be hosted this session today. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Patrick Carpenter. Patrick is a pharmacist located in Portland, Oregon, who specializes in erectile dysfunction, drug regulations, and pharmacy compounding. Today, he's going to cover injection medication, syringe and dosing, injection techniques, support options, and then he'll hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. So, without any further ado, Patrick, I'm going to hand the show over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Ashton. Appreciate that. And thanks for coming to the webinar, everyone. The plan is I'm going to go through some slides pretty quickly, maybe over about 10 minutes. Then I'll do a demonstration with some props here on how to do an injection. That'll take maybe five minutes or so. And then we'll move into the question and answer period. Uh, I hear we got a long list of questions, and that's usually a, a very fun and interactive part of the presentation. So that's the plan. Here we go. We'll start with the erection process. It's a four-step process. You start by having sexy thoughts in your mind, and that causes biochemical changes in your body that cause uh, muscle, smooth muscle in the penis to relax. That relaxation of the smooth muscle allows arterial blood to flow into the penis. That begins to produce tumescence, engorgement, stiffness, uh, rigidity in the penis. And then in addition, that, that rigidity is also squeezing veins and stopping the flow of blood out of the erection. So sexy thoughts, smooth muscle relaxation, blood flow into the penis, restriction of outflow. And then as we talk more through the webinar, that's typically when you would stimulate the penis, either through sexual intercourse or masturbation. And then that's followed by the orgasm. We'll talk now for a few minutes about the medication the syringe and dosing strategies. And uh, again, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions around dosing strategies also. So how do ED medications work? They increase blood flow to the penis, allowing creation of an erection sufficient for sexual intercourse. They do that by relaxing that smooth muscle. Again, normally you have sexy thoughts, your body does it biochemically on its own. What happens with injection is you're injection, injecting smooth muscle relaxants into the penis that forces the muscle to relax and allows that arterial inflow into the penis. The injection liquid is commonly a mixture of two or three medications. The three possible ingredients are alprostadil, papaverine, and phentolamine. When all three of them are combined in an injection, it's typically called trimix. When two of them are combined, that would be papaverine and phentolamine, that's called bimix. There's a variety of different medication concentrations. It is a compounded medication, so a lot of uh, it can be made uh, to, in a variety of different forms. What you see here is the Bimix formulations offered by MenMD. There's some standard Trimix formulations here, and then there's some low l prostadil Trimix formulations on the right. Why do you start with Bimix versus standard Trimix or low l prostadil Trimix? Uh, in some ways, it's trial and error. It's what your urologist may be used to. That said, there could be clinical reasons why you would start with one versus the other. Alprostadil causes an aching sensation in the penis in about 20% of men who inject it. And in that case, your doctor may switch you to a Bimex. Your doctor may start with Bimex to avoid that aching altogether, or you may start with a low Alprostadil trimix also. Uh, there's certain clinical scenarios where patients are more likely to have aching. Patients with diabetes or patients post-radical prostatectomy are more likely to have aching from l -prostadil. And so your urologist may start with a low l trimix or a bimix in those situations. It's always important to note the aching is not harmful. You're not damaging the penis in any way. It's okay to 
continue to inject Trimix, even if you get aching, uh, the problem is it, it can be rate limiting, it can be dose limiting in that uh, some men have such a strong aching sensation that you can't touch the penis, uh, can't move around. I've had patients complain that they can't even put underwear on and get comfortable. So in those cases, if it's interfering with your ability to use and enjoy the erection, those are reasons why we would go to a low l prostatal trimix or bimix or try different dosing strategies to manage that aching. Uh, the needle and syringe, so ICI, intracavernosal injection medications, ICI as we call it, are injected into the penis using a very small needle. It's, it's really an insulin syringe. It's, it's a syringe that was designed uh, to inject insulin for diabetic patients. Uh, the syringe is the plastic part of the device that holds the liquid. The needle is the shiny silver tip. You can see in the graphic there, the plunger is the part that you uh, pull back on and then depress to administer the fluid. There's a dosing chart here that really compares mLs or milliliters to cubic centimeters, cc's, and it also compares that to units. The pharmacist in me always likes to perseverate about the, the name of the unit because it's so important in pharmacy to get the dose right. So 0.3 mLs is the same as 0.3 cc's, which is the same as 30 units. I tend to discuss units because the, the syringe that we're using is going to be labeled in units. And so it's, it's really easy to say the dose and then see it on the syringe. But just for point of fact, your doctor may have written the prescription using mLs or cc's. Your label may say that. It's a helpful chart there on how to convert from one to the other. Okay, your physician, your urologist, your endocrinologist, whoever's prescribing the medication for you is going to set your first dose. That's typically done after a test dose in the office. So you'd make an appointment, the doctor, nurse, physician assistant would teach you how to do the injection. They would often do a dose to see what your response is, make sure that it's safe to send you home with the medication and provide some hands-on training. And then you'll be given uh, advice on how to adjust the dose in order to get a good erection at home. What you're shooting for is an erection that is a seven, eight, or nine on the rigidity scale of zero to 10, where zero is no change in blood flow into the penis. Six would be an erection just firm enough for penetration, and 10 is the maximally rigid erection. That's not necessarily our goal. Again, there, you know, if you get a 10, uh, you can have issues with um, not being able to have an orgasm because the penis is so engorged, the, the nerves aren't transmitting their impulses correctly. So our goal is a seven or a eight or a nine on the erection scale. Uh, and then hopefully you have an orgasm and then the erection goes away promptly after the orgasm. We don't want an erection to stick around. We wanna to try to mimic the natural physiological process that would happen, which again is getting an erection, having intercourse or masturbating, having an orgasm and then losing the erection. A partial erection that's not rigid enough for the entirety of penetrative sex means your dose may be too low. An erection that doesn't come down means that your dose may be too high. Uh, it's important to note that you should not exceed your maximum prescribed dose. You need to consult your physician if you're going to deviate from the prescription. You shouldn't inject more than once in a 24-hour period unless your doctor directs you otherwise. Most doctors recommend no more than three to four times a week to minimize scar tissue formation. So one injection every 24 hours, but no more than three to four times weekly. Again, your physician's gonna give you very specific advice based on your clinical situation. That's a general recommendation, what's typically seen as the maximum. Preparing for the injection, you're gonna gather your supplies, prepare a medication, and then you'll do the injection. So you'll have a medication vial. And again, I'm gonna go through a demonstration of all of this after we get through the slides. You'll have your medication vial. That probably comes in an amber prescription vial with your label on it from the pharmacy. You'll have the needle and syringe. You'll have some alcohol prep pads also. That's gonna be used to clean the top, the rubber stopper on the top of the medication vial. It's also gonna be used to clean the side of the penis prior to doing the injection. You remove the cap from the syringe, expose the needle, pull the plunger back, filling the syringe up with air to the, to the dose that you're going to be withdrawing, uh, the amount of liquid you're gonna be withdrawing from the vial. You insert the needle into the vial, you flip it all upside down to make sure that the, the needle is covered in liquid, push the air into the vial, and then pull back on the plunger to fill the syringe with the volume of liquid. You want to tap the side of the, of the syringe to eliminate any air bubbles. The air bubbles won't hurt you if you inject them. If there's too many in there, it's just going to interfere with the measurement. Um, 
And so to make sure you're measuring your proper dose and to avoid injecting air, you want to tap the side to make sure there's not large air bubbles in there. You swab the injection site with alcohol, as I mentioned, allow it to dry prior to doing the injection. It's important to let it dry uh, to avoid stinging when you pierce the skin and also allowing the ethyl alcohol to have an, or isopropyl alcohol to have an antimicrobial effect on the surface of the skin. You wanna insert the needle into the shaft of the penis uh, between the base and the midpoint. And again, the demonstration will make this more clear. Uh, I usually like to instruct guys to go about a third of the length of the penis away from the body. And then in terms of circumference around the penis, uh, general guidance is anywhere between nine o'clock and 11 o'clock or one o'clock and three o'clock. So if you think of the penis, you see the graphic there on the right, you see the two X's. The top X would be 12 o'clock, the bottom X would be six o'clock. You wanna inject uh, between one and three or nine and 11. I'm a big fan also of going right straight in the side. Um, so the, the needle and syringe are approaching the side of the penis like a line on the horizon right straight in the side. So again, I'm a big fan of nine o'clock or three o'clock. There's reasons why you would need to rotate injections, but certainly when you're learning, I like nine and three to get started. Uh, you wanna avoid veins when you're doing the injection. Again, not because you're going to hurt yourself or damage your penis in some way. Uh, if you go right through a vein, there's more likely to be bleeding and bruising after the injection. You wanna gently press the plunger to inject the medication. It should take one to two seconds for each 10 units of fluid that you're injecting. You don't want to jam down on the plunger really quickly. I know you probably want to get the needle out of the side of your penis uh, naturally, but if you if you push down on the plunger too quickly, you run the risk of not letting the medicine settle in the right place or interfering with your technique when you're injecting. So if you're injecting 30 units, that injection should take three to six seconds, one to two seconds for every 10 units of fluid that you're injecting. You wanna remove the needle and apply compression to the entry site for two to three minutes to prevent bruising or bleeding. Again, I'll show that in the demonstration. Talking about side effect mitigation, you wanna use proper injection techniques. So much of this is injection technique. Guys will inject and then it won't work the way it did in the doctor's office. And right away the impulse is there's something wrong with the medication or you know something else is wrong. Uh, most of the time it's injection technique. I tell guys that you should expect to have to practice about six times before you get this all figured out. So if you can commit to trying six practice injections, um, you know, that puts you in the right state of mind to get the technique down, figure out your dosing. And some guys will include their partner in that, some won't. It depends on your relationship and how disappointed you or your partner may be if the first experimental doses don't work while you're figuring out your technique and dose. You want to rotate injection sites, as I mentioned, uh, to avoid scar tissue buildup in the penis. No more than one injection every 24 hours and as directed by your physician, as I mentioned on a prior slide. Uh, you want to store punctured vials or sealed vials in the refrigerator as a, as a compounded medication. It should be refrigerated. The beyond use date, that's kind of like the expiration date. We don't need to get into the intricate regulatory reasons uh, why there, one is a beyond use date, one is an expiration date. But you think of the beyond use date like an expiration date, that will be on the amber vial from the pharmacy. Uh, that's gonna tell you the date beyond which you should not use the medication. And all multi-dose vials are 28 days after first puncture. So you're gonna get the vial and although it may be good for 30 days, uh, once you puncture it, it, it shortens that down to 28 days. That's to eliminate uh, the risk of uh, contamination. You know, you think of, uh, we live in a dirty world. If you see the sun streaking through a window, you might see uh, dust flying in the air. You know, you're, you're withdrawing the shiny silver needle and exposing that to this dirty air, putting it in the vial. So there is some risk of contamination. Uh, that's why we have the 28 day after first puncture recommendation to keep everyone safe. Injection accessories help. There's several different injection tools. Uh, we'll talk here also quickly about safe syringe disposal and I'll mention the travel case. Uh, you see the Insultote in the upper left-hand corner. It's called Insultote again because it was designed for diabetics, uh, but that can hold an auto injector. There's a small ice uh, pack in there, gel pack, that allows you to keep the medication cold. You can put a needle and syringe in there. It's this sort of discreet black carrying case uh, so that no one will know what you have in there. Insulese, if we move over to the top right, that's a magnifying device. If you have trouble seeing the gradations on the syringe 
or maybe there's dexterity issues and you have a hard time holding on to the syringe, the insulase could help with that. If we move to the bottom left, there's the auto injector. Uh, the auto injector, you know, people f uh, feel very strongly one way or the other about this. There are people that like the auto injector, there are people that hate the auto injector. I try to take the position that I'll teach a patient to do whatever is going to work for them. Uh, again, if there's dexterity issues, the auto injector could help. I've had patients who have Parkinson's disease that get shaky when they're trying to do fine motor movements and making it all larger by putting it in the auto injector sort of helps. Uh, that said, on the flip side, um, well, you know, the auto injector can sort of hide the needle and get guys over some of the discomfort associated with the injection. But there is a risk if you don't set the auto injector up properly uh, that you're going to go too shallow with the injection and you'll never get a good response. So the auto injector setup can complicate the injection some. So you need to know yourself and you need to sort of weigh the needle phobia against the, the potential dissatisfaction from um, doing an injection and not having a good result because the auto injector is not set up correctly. Uh, we can talk more about the auto injector if that comes up during questions and answers. And then of course, there's a Sharps container. Um, different states, different counties throughout the country have different rules about how to throw away and use needles and syringes. Some jurisdictions allow them to be thrown right in the trash. Some jurisdictions allow them to be put in any thick walled plastic container like an empty laundry detergent container and then certain places require you to put it in a biohazard container. These days, most pharmacies are taking back uh, used needles and syringe containers. You can also Google, I think there's a website, safeneedledisposal.org, and you can put in your address and figure out how to return needles and syringes in your area. If you need help, uh, please contact a MenMD personal health assistant. Uh, the website is there. You're probably on the portal. That's probably how you ended up here at this webinar. The phone number for MenMD is shown there. And this is a team of very dedicated, caring people that really want to help you uh, be successful with this medication. So there's tremendous resources there available for you. Uh, the personal health assistants, case managers can help work with you on dosing strategies, techniques, all of that. Very good resource for you to take advantage of. We will move now then uh, into the demonstration and then to the question and answer session. All right, so I have uh, the amber vial, of uh, which would have a label on it if it was from you. I've taken the glass vial of medication at it, which when you have it, it will also have a little label from the batch on there. I have the needle and syringe pulled out. I am particular to the one cc 5 16th of an inch, 31 gauge, needle and syringe. 31 gauge is the finest that you can get. Uh, 5 16th is a short needle. And I've just always worked with a 1cc. If you're injecting a small amount, if you're injecting just 10 units, uh, you could get a half cc or 50 unit syringe. Um, just over the years, I've just always used a 1cc, 5 16th of an inch, 31 gauge uh, needle and syringe. I'll mention here uh, regarding the length of the needle, it, it, it's also common for a physician to prescribe, and in many places, these things are sold over the counter, so you can request whatever length you want. Some physicians train using a half inch needle, and your injection technique is somewhat dependent on the length of the needle that you're using. So with a 5 16th of an inch needle, the shorter needle, you want to be sure to really go into the penis, right into the side, maybe even pushing so that the hub creates a small indent in the side of the penis. The hub is where the shiny silver needle meets the plastic of the syringe. So with the shorter 5 16th of an inch needle, you want to push right into the side. With the half inch needle, it's not necessary to make that indent. But another common uh, source of injection failures is Guys will maybe be trained using a half inch needle by the doctor, and then without thinking about it, they choose uh, to fill a prescription with the shorter needle length because that sounds more appealing. And then they use a half inch technique while administering using the 5 16th shorter needle, and things go awry there because you're not administering the medication directly to the target site that we need to reach in the penis. Okay, the other thing I've got here are the alcohol pads. And then I have a prop penis that I'm going to use. And this always gets a little strange because I have to hold on to it. If you're doing the injection yourself, obviously you'll have both hands free. But because I'm going to be showing you how to do the injection with the prop penis, I'm going to be holding on to this. So we'll just work through that together and, and talk through that. So 
First things first, I'm going to open an alcohol prep pad. And I'm going to rub the top of the vial, the rubber stopper on there to clean that. Uh, just do a couple of strokes here, vertical strokes, to clean the top of the vial. Let that dry for a moment. You know, at this point, you could clean the side of the penis, you could, or you could wait and draw up the dose. It, it, it you know, as you do this more and more, you're going to get better at it, and it's going to be faster. So I, I'm going to just go ahead and clean the side of the penis here. So I'm going to say we're going to inject in the left side of the penis. Uh, we talked in terms of the length of the penis, where to inject. I'll show you this way because uh, it's that's the best visual. You want to inject anywhere from halfway between the base and the tip of the penis or closer to the base. And again, I'm a big fan of going about a third of the length of the penis. So right there where my middle finger is pointing is about where I'd recommend doing the injection. Uh, and then if we talk about the circumference of the penis around, I use that clock analogy where this would be 12 o'clock. Uh, we don't inject there. This would be six o'clock. We don't inject there. Uh, I'm a big fan, as I said, of going right straight in the side. This would be uh, nine o'clock. And then over here, would be three o'clock, I think, or I may have the three and the nine mixed up, but you know what I mean, right straight in the side of the penis, like the wing of an airplane or the line on a horizon. So if I just put my finger here where I'm gonna put the needle, you can see that I'm about a third of the way or maybe halfway down the length of the shaft. And then in terms of the circumference, I am right straight in the side of the penis. Okay, so I've cleaned the top of the vial. Uh, I'm now going to rub the side of the penis. Again, this will be a little easier for you because the penis is attached to your body. Just generally clean that area, give the alcohol a chance to dry, as I mentioned. That's going to avoid stinging and allow the alcohol to have an antimicrobial effect. Okay. I'll put the penis down for a moment, and um, I will now work to draw up the fluid into the needle and syringe. There's a cap over the plunger. We want to remove that and then we're gonna remove the orange cap over the needle and syringe, over the syringe rather. Let me get really close to the needle here, uh, to the camera, you can see how tiny the needle is. All right. So I'm approaching the rubber stopper, I'm just going slow here so I can try and watch my camera to make sure I'm showing you what I'm doing. I'm going right into the rubber stopper right there in the center like a bullseye, goes in very easily. You know what I didn't do? I didn't pull up the, uh, I didn't fill the syringe first with the volume of air. Uh, that's okay. Uh, it's a small volume. If we were filling a different type of syringe, it, it's a little more important. I'm gonna just pull up 30 units here. So I'm pulling back. Uh, I'm trying to balance my need to see what I'm doing against uh, my desire to show you what I'm doing through the camera. So I've got the black plunger line right there about on 30, as you can probably see. We're measuring uh, the amount of liquid that's in there. So, so the 30 is right there. I don't have a ton of air. Uh, let's see if I can show you. There's a bubble or two, nothing in there that's really gonna interfere, but if there was, you can flick the side. You know, you would maybe do this while you've got, let's say you had a big bunch of air in there, you flip the side and then you push up. And you can push until you see, I've got a little drip there. And if I, if I show very closely, you know, I'm right on the 30 line. So that's about 30 units that we're gonna inject. So we're ready to go. We've cleaned the side of the penis. Uh, again, I've shown you in terms of the length and circumference, I'm going about a third of the way in right inside. So this can be done quicker than this, but I'm gonna go slow here to show you. This is a 5 16th of an inch needle. And so it's okay to push a little bit. If you're holding the penis, uh, you can push a little bit almost so that the penis bends a little, like the string on a bow and arrow. You're not gonna hurt yourself by doing that a little bit. And you can start to see the dimple that is created by the hub where the shiny silver needle meets the plastic. So we're right in the side of the penis, and then you slowly depress the plunger, 
Uh, I'm doing 30 units, so you remember my rule. I said one to two seconds for each 10 units. So I'm starting now, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five 1,000. We're done. Remove the needle and syringe. At this point, you would potentially squeeze right, uh, right where the needle came out. You want to squeeze to prevent the fluid from coming out. You want to put some compression on there in order to stop bruising and bleeding. It's okay even to squeeze a little bit to manipulate the penis like this. And you want to hold there and squeeze a bit to begin to interact with the penis and, and again, prevent bruising and bleeding, but also interact with the penis and start touching it a little bit to begin to stimulate the effects of the medication. So we hold, hold, hold. This could go on for a minute, two minutes. Again, it's, if you're on blood thinners, you'd want to hold longer because you're more likely to bruise or bleed. Uh, and you'll figure this out over time. And that's it. That's the injection. So you should start to get an erection uh, within minutes. And uh, full effect will be achieved within 10 minutes. Let me talk for a minute about bruising and bleeding. Lots of times guys get really anxious about this if they get bruising. Sometimes it's a small bruise or, or you know, they'll see a drop of blood. And then the next morning they wake up and, they're, and their penis is very, very bruised. I've seen um, you know, sort of fully purple penises is very scary, but it's, it's nothing really to be scared about. Um, it's just blood that has gotten under the skin of the penis and it spreads. And because the thinnest skin, the skin is thin, it can really spread and create a lot of, uh, a lot of bruising all under the penis. It will subside like any bruise over time it can take three, four, five, six days. Uh, the bruising will begin to change color. It'll go from that purple to yellow and whatnot. Again, nothing really to worry about. Just aesthetically, it's uh, not great, and it, it tends to cause some anxiety, but there's nothing necessarily to worry about there. So the only thing I want to mention again, uh, because I, I didn't draw up air before I went into the plunger, let me do that again for a minute. So you can draw up to 30 here, you know, fill the syringe with air to the amount that you're going to inject, and then enter the vial. Now push the air into the syringe and then pull back. Again, you don't have to do that. You saw that the first time I didn't do it. This is really more relevant when you're doing large volumes, which you wouldn't do for a penile injection. Uh, if we were mixing meds in the clean room or something using a 30 cc syringe, it becomes more important to equalize the pressure in the vial and the needle and syringe. Um, so I just showed you there how to first fill up the syringe with air, inject that in, and then withdraw. And I've got 30 units in here again. All right, so we've done the slides. We have done a demonstration. I am putting the cap on the needle now, which you can't see off screen, bear with me. I've recap, you don't, you don't necessarily have to recap it. You could throw it right in the sharps container. I've got a sharps container here. Open that up and we'll put our used needle and syringe in there. And we're good to go. So with that, uh, we can go to questions and answers. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump into the Q and A portion of the event. <clears throat> um, just before we ask the first question, I'd just like it to be known that we have 50 plus questions written down. Um, we won't be able to ask every single question, but hopefully we'll we'll be able to ask a question that covers what you submitted. So, <clears throat> first question we're going to ask um, is kind of revolves around why someone may choose to use injection therapy. This person asked, "What is the percentage of men that use injection therapy successfully?" It, it, the, the medication itself works in over 90% of men. I, you know, I like to say there's there's virtually no one that can't get an erection using injection therapy. I, I mean, there are some very advanced cases uh, with of guys who have a venous leak and and you know 90 year old patients that have been ravaged by diabetes for 50 years and have had prostate surgery. Like in these worst case scenarios, there's a possibility the med isn't going to work, but Injection therapy is so effective uh, to get a natural blood-filled erection. The vast majority of people who 
uh, commit to learning how to do the injection and our patient and finding their dose can get to a place where a dose is working reliably and predictably for them each time they use the the injection. And then when do you have to change strengths? You know, if maybe if you're med if you you take other medications that change or your clinical condition changes. Um, or just with the passage of time, you know, each year we're not getting any younger, we're getting older. And so, uh, you know, your blood pressure may get worse, your diabetes may get worse. So maybe perhaps yearly, there would be reasons why we would need to adjust the dose. But once you have committed to doing, say, six injections to get your technique mastered and find your dose, the injections really should work reliably and predictably for you each time. So, you know, my, my short answer is that injection therapy will work for almost every man. Awesome, that's uh, great to hear. So moving along right here, um, <clears throat> next question. These next few questions are gonna all be regarding injection techniques. So first question here is, I have mixed results based on where I inject on my penis. Can you recommend a specific area to have the best results with injections? Yeah, I, I think it's just technique related. I mean, there, there could be some scar tissue in your penis. Um, uh, you know, sometimes if someone's right-handed, uh, you know, and they're used to injecting over here, and then for the purpose of rotating, they switch and put the needle in their left hand, that's enough that can sort of throw off your technique, right? It, it's no different than trying to suddenly write with your left hand versus write with your right hand. So most of the time, this is related to technique, and it is important to rotate sites, but if you're, you know, if you haven't practiced enough, um, and you are feeling discouraged, it, it's okay to do the, the first several injections in or around the same spot. Again, I'm a big fan of right straight in the side, three o'clock or nine o'clock. The reason for that is because if we start to do an injection, I'm gonna take out another needle here. Uh, I'm not gonna take the cap off, but you know, if we're going in like this, which is an okay technique, this is probably, you know, what is this, one o'clock, two o'clock, something like that, like anywhere in here is okay, but you're starting to be off center. And what if you go this way too much? Or, you know, there's just angle issues that you can have like this. So for that reason, I'm a big fan of right straight in the side, like a line on the horizon. It's very hard to mess up the angle when you go right straight in the side. So certainly when guys are starting, I'm a big fan of right straight in the side because it minimizes variability. All right, kind of piggybacking off something uh, you mentioned about left-handed, right-handed in, in that question. This person said um, they are left-handed with a big vein on the left side of the penis. They wanna know what is the best way to avoid the veins? What happens if they hit a vein? Yeah, so I, I you know, the questions came in ahead of time, right? So you didn't know that I was going to explain that. But as I mentioned, uh, hitting the vein is uh, you're not going to bleed to death. You're not going to your penis isn't going to fall off. It's it just puts you at a greater risk of bruising or bleeding. Um, so you do want to try to avoid the vein. Is is there a way that you can go? You know, I mentioned anywhere from halfway to all, all the way to the base. Maybe the vein moves a bit, and you can just vary in terms of the length where you're going. If the vein runs directly down the left lateral portion of the penis, you know, then you might have to go up a little bit and come in maybe at 230. And you know, I wouldn't try to go through the vein. I, I think you're doing the right thing by avoiding the vein. Uh, but your point is well uh, taken that you're left-handed, there's a vein on the left side, sort of less than ideal, what do I do? It's gonna come down to trial and error and just find some real estate on the penis uh, that is in terms of length, halfway to a third would be ideal, and then um, three o'clock uh, to not to uh, three to six, no, excuse me, well, one, two, Three, one o'clock to three o'clock, and then nine o'clock to 11 o'clock, somewhere in there. All righty, next question here. What impact does being uncircumcised have on injection therapy? No impact, uh, no impact in terms of the effect. I think the, um, there's a possibility if the foreskin is, is over the head of the penis that you could be holding the penis and sort of twist it and if you can't see the head properly uh, and you were to twist the penis, you can probably see what I'm doing here. 
you know, if you were to do the injection with the penis twisted, you're not actually going in what would be three o'clock, you're actually going in the ventral surface of the underside of the penis. So the only uh, effect of, of uncircumcised is you just want to make sure that the penis is sort of in its natural resting state so that 12 o'clock and six o'clock are, are properly aligned so that when you inject, you're going into what would be three o'clock or nine o'clock. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you leave the skin extended or retract the skin. Um, if you're pulling the skin back to expose the head of the penis, it, it may just be sort of thicker down along the base of the penis. And you'd want to pay careful attention if you're using that 5 16th of an inch needle to make sure that you are creating that dimple in the side of the penis to make sure that you're pushing through any extra thickness from the, the skin pulled back on the penis. All righty. Next question here. What is the best position to stimulate the penis following injection? Is reclining, sitting, or standing best, better? Yeah, uh, uh, hopefully it doesn't matter for you, uh, but standing would be my recommendation because there's a condition called venous leakage um, and standing can offset some of the venous leakage. So if you remember when we were going through the slides, we talked about uh, you do the injection, it relaxes the smooth muscle in the penis, arterial blood flows into the penis, and as the penis begins to uh, develop rigidity, there's also a squeezing of the veins that happen. So getting and maintaining an erection is a delicate balance of blood flow in and out of the penis. And in men who have a venous leak, that clamping effect doesn't happen. And so even though you're stimulating arterial inflow, the veins aren't being squeezed, and so it's rushing out as fast as it's going in. So when you're standing up, you're less likely to have that venous leak effect. Now, not every man has it, right? Your, your urologist could do a Doppler ultrasound on you and do an injection and then use the ultrasound machine to measure blood flow and could uh, definitively diagnose you with venous leak. But it, it, the 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 sort of quick way to know if you have a venous leak is guys will say, well, I did the injection standing up, I got a great erection, and then I laid down on my back to begin to have sex with my partner, and the, I lost the erection when I laid down. Surefire sign uh, that you have a venous leak. So because in the beginning, when I'm trying to teach patients how to inject, and it's so important to uh, have them have a reliable and predictable experience, I will typically say, stand up when you're doing the injection and stand, stay standing while you're stimulating the penis because you're just minimizing that, that potential variable of venous leakage. And in those guys that where I said, you know, they would lay down to have sex with their partner or get on top of their partner and they lose the erection, sure enough, when they stand up, the erection comes back and it's it has to do with with blood flow and um, uh, blood pressure and whatnot related to venous leakage so short answer standing is going to be the best way to to start stimulating the penis to see the effects of the erection already standing it is next question here i seem to always have a burning sensation after i inject how can i stop this the burning sensation, you know, without being able to ask you more specific questions, I have to answer this very generally. Um, could you be injecting too quickly after wiping with alcohol and you're you're pushing some of the alcohol into the tissue uh, with the needle? Maybe uh, if we've ruled that out, uh, could this be alprostadil related? You know, I describe it as an aching. It's usually not instantaneous. That does manifest in some men as a burning sensation. So maybe this is alprostadil related. Um, are you injecting too quickly? You know, are you jamming down on the plunger really quickly and that's causing this tissue disruption that's that's manifesting as a burning sensation? Those are a few of the things that come to mind. Um, another possibility, you know, after you do the injection, uh, you could squeeze the whole penis like this. You know, I talked about applying pressure right at the injection site to minimize bruising and bleeding. Another possibility is to sort of squeeze the whole penis. So you've, you've laid your penis in your hand. I'm trying to show you what I'm doing here. And you squeeze like you're making a fist and relaxing a fist. 
making a fist and relaxing a fist. And when you make the fist, you can sort of wiggle your fingers, right? So you're manipulating the PNS. You're beginning to get the, the fluid that you injected to move around inside the corpus cavernosum. That's the spongy erectile tissue we've injected into. And as blood, that arterial blood begins to flow in, you're sort of helping mix the injection with the uh, blood flow. And maybe that helps with the burning. Those are a couple of things that come to mind. I hope something there is helpful for you. Awesome. All righty. Next question here. How much force is required to complete a successful injection? I seem to have to push really hard to inject the medication. Yeah, that's so that's that doesn't sound right. Um, there should not be a lot of force when you depress the plunger. I talked about uh, pressing uh, for one to two seconds for every 10 units of fluid. The plunger should should go down like you're injecting into butter. It should be very, very smooth. You know, when you first when you take a new needle and syringe and you first get it going, you'll feel a little bit of resistance, right? I don't know if you could just see I was struggling, but now that I've got it moving, it sort of freely moves in and out. So maybe what you want to do is take a take a needle and syringe and just move it and, and see what it feels like. It really shouldn't feel any different than that when you're injecting the fluid into the side of the penis. There's a couple of reasons why you might be feeling resistance. So you're going through several layers of tissue to, to arrive at the target, this corpus cavernosum, the very specific site in the penis that we need the medicine to get into in order for it to have an effect. So you're going through a couple of millimeters of, of loose skin, and then you're hitting a tissue layer in the penis, which is thicker and tough, called the tunica albiginia. You need to go right through the tunica albiginia. So sometimes if you're not deep enough, and you're trying to inject and the tip of the needle is in that tunica layer, that's gonna be very hard to inject into. Uh, so that's one possibility. So if you're using a 5 16th of an inch needle, I would encourage you to make a dimple with the hub as I described. Maybe you'll have a little bit of a bowing uh, effect on the side of the penis when you're in there. That should mean you're deep enough. Uh, if that's not the case, there could be some scar tissue that's building up if you've injected in that spot over and over again, or maybe you're just one of the unlucky guys that gets scar tissue build up. Um, there could be a little pocket of scar tissue and I would recommend trying the other side or uh, varying the length. So maybe you're injecting right at the half, uh, maybe you're injecting a third and that's where you're feeling the resistance come more to the center in terms of the length of the penis. You're just looking for real estate that wouldn't have scar tissue in it. And then since I'm talking about sort of rotating sites, you just never would want to inject around the head of the penis. This is going to, for two reasons, it's going to hurt because this is the most sensitive part of the penis, but also the corpus cavernosum, the target sort of changes up there and thins out a bit and it becomes a different type of erectile tissue. It becomes the corpus spongiosum, which surrounds the, the urethra. We don't want to inject into there. So never get too close to the tip for two reasons. One is it's not going to work. The other is it's going to hurt. Um, so very this way, very this way, looking for a spot where there's not scar tissue. Um, and then again, the earlier recommendation was maybe you're not going deep enough and the tip of the needle is in that tunic albiginia or some other more superficial layer of the penis before we've got all the way to the, to the midpoint area of the penis into that target, the corpus cavernosum. Hope that helps. Awesome, all right. Last injection technique question. Um, what is the best practice to inject if you have a large belly to deal with? Okay, um, you could use a mirror. Um, you could try laying on your back. Um, it's just gonna take more practice. Um, I would say, you know, it, you're just gonna have to get creative. It's, uh, is it possible for your partner to do the injection? Uh, there's plenty of couples that do that. Um, you could sort of teach your your partner how to do the injection. It could become part of some role playing. Uh, you know, it could just be part of the whole experience. Other than that, it's really just more practice, I would say. I, I've had patients talk about using a mirror, but uh, you know, I can barely use the mirrors when I'm driving. Mirrors confuse me, right? I don't know which way it's going. What am I seeing? So I'm imagining you sort of struggling with the injection and moving this way, and you're seeing it in the mirror. So personally, maybe that's my own bias because I, I, I don't trust mirrors, but uh, you, you could try a mirror, but I, I don't see that being, uh, I don't see that being successful. Um, it's trial and error. 
uh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Alrighty, we're now gonna move along to some general injection questions. So first question here is, at what point should a person consider switching from pills to injections? Certainly if pills aren't working, you know, so you're taking Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, something like that, you're using oral medications and they're not working, you're not getting an erection that you'd rate as a seven or an eight or a nine on that rigidity scale, or the erection is not lasting for the duration of sexual intercourse. Um, sometimes after prostate surgery, you know, for six months or so, men may be on a, an oral medication, but that's not necessarily to get an erection. It's because of some of the oxygenation that occurs in the penis. That's a commonly confused uh, area. Men will, men will be prescribed Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, something like that right after a radical prostatectomy, and then they're dismayed because they're not getting an erection, but they miss the point that there's a therapeutic effect of taking that medicine, even though for six months or more after a radical prostatectomy, you're going to have no effect. Uh, very unlikely that you'd have an effect from oral medication, but there's still therapeutic value to taking it because of the increased oxygenation that occurs in the penis to allow it to heal. So the big signal to me to switch from oral medicines to injection would be when they stop working. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is, you know, maybe there's really intolerable side effects from the oral medication. Uh, maybe you take oral medication and you get a great erection sufficient for sexual intercourse, but you get a stuffy nose and a pounding headache, and then you don't feel good for hours, or you get flushed red like a tomato. Some, some patients have side effects that they find really unpalatable from oral medications, and uh, those same side effects won't occur with injection therapy. Uh, just one more thing, Ashton. Sorry. Just you know, uh, those PDE5 inhibitors, the oral medications are contraindicated for patients who take nitrates. So maybe there's a contraindication. Why? Um, certainly, the big thing that comes to mind is lack of efficacy. If it's not working, then it's time to try something else. Awesome. All right. Next question here is about the long-term side effects of injection therapy. This person asks, what are the long-term side effects of injection therapy, and is there possible long-term damage to the penis, such as scar tissue? Yeah, scar tissue is always a possibility, but scar tissue isn't really well understood in the urology community. So there have been cases where guys have prostatectomy, and they don't do injection therapy, and then they still end up with scar tissue. And the leading theory about that is, that, again, this sort of decreased oxygenation post-trauma from the surgery causes scar tissue to form. So, you know, you're trying to balance the risk of this post-surgical deoxygenated penis atrophy that could lead to scar tissue against the possible risk of repeated trauma from the needle leading to scar tissue, right? If you are an ice skater or a roller skater and you fall on your knee and you skin your knee, you know, the first time you'll get a scab and it'll heal and everything's fine. If you repeatedly fall on your knee over and over and over again and continually sort of damage your knee and damage the skin and bleed, you're gonna end up with a scar on your knee. It's no different with the penis from repeated trauma from the needle to the same location on the penis. This is why it's important to rotate sites. Um, so is scar tissue formation a possibility from injecting long-term? I mean, I would say yes, but the, the alternate warning there is that you may get scar tissue even if you don't inject. And again, that's one of the reasons why you may go on an oral PDE5 inhibitor after prostate surgery uh, to minimize that deoxygenated penile atrophy state and to minimize the likelihood of scar tissue formation. So personally, I wouldn't let the risk of scar tissue formation, uh, what's the alternative? Just never getting an erection again or never having sex? That feels sort of unpalatable to me also. So I wouldn't let the possible theoretical risk of scar tissue formation from injection deter you from injecting. Um, everyone has to sort of do that risk of benefit analysis themselves. But if there's nothing else that's going to work for you, um, having a penis that's never erect and that doesn't allow you to have sexual intercourse, but that doesn't have scar tissue, that just doesn't feel like a win. So um, scar tissue is a, is, a, is a potential risk. 
scar tissue in and of itself, you know, you may feel nodules in the penis when you're when you're squeezing the penis. You know, you may feel a little lump or a bump in there. And for some guys, that's all that happens, and it doesn't alter the structure or function of the penis in any way. What can happen with scar tissue, what we worry about, is that the scar tissue sort of knots up the corpus cavernosum, that uh, uh, tish, that soft, smooth muscle tissue that swells to cause the erection, and it's kind of like putting super glue on a sponge. So if you took a dry sponge that shriveled up and put some super glue in one part of it and then wet the sponge, uh, as the sponge expands, it's going to expand everywhere except where you put the super glue. And if we go back away from the sponge analogy to the penis, uh, in the case of scar tissue in the corpus cavernosum, if scar tissue develops and knots up the corpus cavernosum, as you get an erection, it can cause sort of bending to the penis. So the blood will flow around the scar tissue, and then you can end up with this angling deformity of the penis. It's called Peyronie's disease. Um, again, that can happen. This is why you need to uh, see your doctor regularly. Your urologist should be doing a physical exam yearly. You should be feeling the penis yourself. You should not be injecting through scar tissue. You should be rotating injection sites. These are things that you can do to minimize the risk of scar tissue formation. I hope that helps uh, to the best I can uh, without sort of specifically speaking to you. Awesome. <clears throat> Alrighty. So next question is about um, combining other modalities. So this person says they have a VED and they're wondering if they should use it before or after injections. So a VED, a vacuum erection device, is a sort of cone that you put over the penis and you uh, use a pump or it's battery powered and it creates a vacuum around the penis and that vacuum causes arterial blood, uh, venous and arterial blood to flow into the penis and then to maintain that erection you use a constriction loop around the base of the penis. Uh, this isn't a VED lecture but the constriction loop would go here and then that sort of traps the blood that you've pulled into the penis using the VED there. Do you, is there benefit to combining modalities? Uh, maybe. Um, if it works for you, it's, it's absolutely okay to do it. It feels a little complicated to me. So I don't know that I would take a new patient and instruct them to use the VED and inject because you're just sort of adding more things that could go wrong, more things to complicate this. So most guys can get to a place where they can inject on their own, just inject and have a, a, an erection that's rated a seven or an eight or a nine. If you inject and you don't get a, a fully, an, a, an erection sufficient for penetration, it's okay to put the VED on that partial erection and use the VED to fully inflate the penis and then use the constriction loop. Alternative, you know, and, and if you don't want to do that, if that sort of solves your problem in the moment, that's fine. That would be one reason why before your next dose, assuming your doctor and the prescription allow you to, that you would raise the dose. You're describing not getting an erection sufficient for sexual intercourse with the injection alone. So that means your dose is not right. So you could raise the dose, assuming your physician will allow that, or maybe you need to go to a different concentration of medication. In terms of using the VED prior to injection, there is a school of thought that, you know, if you take a totally flaccid penis and cause some engorgement with the VED and then remove the VED without using the constriction loop, that you've increased the real estate. You've sort of swelled the balloon a bit, if you will, making it easier to find the corpus cavernosum. What I, I worry about two things there. I worry again that it's just sort of one more device, one more thing. You take the VED off, you're rapidly losing the erection, you're fumbling for the needle. So it doesn't sort of, it's not a setup that inspires a lot of confidence in me. And then I also worry that if you do the injection as the partially filled cavernosum is deflating, that you're sort of diluting the medication and it's rinsing right out of the penis. So for those reasons, it's not a go to strategy that I use. That said, I have had patients that have, have trouble doing an injection, and I have ever recommended starting to cause some tumescence with the VED prior to doing the injection. But again, this is an advanced technique, and I would work with your uh, case manager or your doctor around how to do that. I don't think that um, if you're just learning um, that that's something you need to, to try. 
Alrighty. <clears throat> Last question in the general injection section is after injection, after injecting, is it okay for oral sex? My wife isn't too sure about this. Yeah, the uh, you know the medication is inside the penis. Um, uh, the you know you've wiped an alcohol pad on the side of the penis. There may be a uh, like a funny chemical taste to to the side of the penis. You know, just wipe yourself off with a washcloth maybe after you do the injection. Um, there could be a, a little bit of a blood that has come out of the skin there. There so there's an increased risk of sexually transmitted infections. Sounds like maybe you're not in a you know, this is not a stranger, this is not a casual hookup, probably not a worry there, but obviously with an exposed wound on the side of the penis from the needle, um, there's an increased risk of transmission from the mouth for, for sexually transmitted infections. In the absence of a sexually transmitted infection, I wouldn't worry about sort of normal germs from the mouth. Um, there's no reason why your partner could not uh, perform oral sex on you after an injection. There's, there's just nothing to worry about there. Good to know. Alrighty, <clears throat> we're uh, just about wrapping up questions here. We have one more question regarding injection storage. This person asks, what happens if I use the medication after the expiration date? The vial is not punctured, it's not cheap, and I hate to throw it out. Any difference if it is punctured? Well, there's, so let's start with if it's not punctured. If it's not punctured, um, the pharmacy does a lot of studies around the degradation of the ingredients when it's mixed. Uh, you know, alprostadil in particular is, is very labile, very sensitive chemical, and it's broken down. It's degraded naturally by the presence of water, and this is mixed in water. And so each day the alprostadil is breaking down. So there's very, very strict rules that govern the claims the pharmacy can make around the product and when can they sell it. And the pharmacy sort of can't sell the product if any of the ingredients have gone below 90% or in some cases 95%. And, you know, I could talk about drug regulations like lovers talk about re read poetry to one another. I don't think it's going to interest you all uh, that much. But long story short, the ingredients are degrading. And if you've had a vial sitting in the fridge for 40 days, it's beyond the expiration date on the vial. The ingredients are degraded a bit. You're going to potentially do an injection. It's not going to work as well. And then you're going to be thinking, well, geez, do I raise my dose? Well, then you're going to get a new vial that's going to be fully potent. You're going to do think, oh, the last one, it complicates things, you see. And so there's a lack of reliability. and. Um, I know it feels wasteful. Sometimes guys will ask, can you do smaller vials, right? It's it's a very tricky thing, figuring out sort of how to balance a patient's safety, efficacy in terms of reliability and predictability, and then the cost sensitivity uh, that patients have. Um, so there's a potency issue if it hasn't been punctured. And you know, that's there's there's just variability there. If it has been punctured, you know, then there's a sterility issue, and that's you know that's uh, very risky. Um, it's just not something you want to play around with, right? There's you're injecting into the penis, which fills with blood, and then when the you lose the erection, that blood returns to your systemic circulation and travels through the rest of your body. So if you've injected uh, you know, let's say you you have inadvertently contaminated the vial. It's not going to change color until it's fully rancid and disgusting, right? There's been studies done that look at how much bacteria can can grow in the vial before it changes color, um, and it's going to look clean and safe to you, even though there's bacteria in there. And you inject into the penis, you could get an infection on your skin. The infection could travel elsewhere. You know, there there are these sort of fungal infections that people could get, and these things have happened, right? So um to me it's like playing with fire right you're you're balancing you know I, I don't know how much the medications cost these days let's say it's a hundred bucks that's not an insignificant amount of money you, you you're buying a you know a hundred dollar vial once a month you're wet you're weighing the risks there I, personally I, I can't I wouldn't recommend that you use an expired vial I just don't think it's worth it I'd like to thank Patrick for taking the time to present today, and we'd also like to thank everyone for listening in and attending this MedMD Real Talk webinar. We hope it was informative and you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more about injection therapy, you have a few options. As I mentioned in the introduction, we've attached the injection therapy guide to this event. 
If you'd like, you may download the PDF for your reference later. That will be found in the handouts tab. There are also more resources in the Resource Center on manmd.com. You can visit this page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and much more. You can also contact ManMD at 857-233-5837 or log in to the password-protected secure ManMD portal to schedule an appointment with a ManMD clinical case manager. If you're interested in purchasing injection accessories, you can learn more or purchase them on the shop page in the ManMD portal. We will also be sending a follow-up email with references to helpful resources and links to each after the event. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks everybody, appreciate it.